Natalie, and welcome to an ARC Daily interview. Thank you. Um, so let's start asking you about the conference. Berlin Questions is a, is a conference for the immediate present. How do you perceive the new now, especially with the new challenge of COVID-19? And what are the problems that you think we should tackle first? Basically, what are the priorities? Complex question. Um, I think COVID has, it's done two things. One, it's made us all extremely disconnected from each other, but it's also given us time to reflect in a way that I think previously was quite hard to do. You know, before the pandemic, I was on a flight every other week. I think this is symptomatic for many people that the pace of life was so hectic that you just didn't have the time to stop and reflect. So the pandemic has given us that time, but it has also made it harder to know what to reflect on. So in a way, there's been an, a period of incredible confusion. Like what do I focus on? What's the priority? What do I tackle first? And I think these are some of the questions that are being asked at this conference is not just what to do, but how to think about what to do. Um, for me, this is really clear. We, we kind of need to figure out how to think about this. Yeah. And um, so your talk today was titled Africa as the lab for the future. Why do you think Africa is the lab for the future? So we're the world's youngest um, continent. So the average age in, the, in Africa is under 20. Uh, Europe, I think, is around 38, so almost double. We're also the continent with the world's oldest leaders. So the gap between our demographic and our leadership is enormous. And as someone who's now teaching students who are a generation, sometimes a generation and a half younger than me, it's very clear to me that the questions that are on the minds of 20, 25, 30 year olds even though there's similar questions to the ones that are on my mind, their way of thinking about it is very different to mine. So even as an educator, I feel this tension between where I am and where they are. And I am at least a generation younger than our leaders. Mm -hmm. So for me, this question about how to translate what your population is thinking, feeling, doing, and how to lead is a really interesting one. And that's why I really do see Africa as a kind of laboratory, because it's it's an experiment um, and it's experimental um, in a way that I think very few other places are. So, yeah. so it's a place where actually now you can experiment. Absolutely. And I mean, when I ran the school, I started a school in Johannesburg, it was very interesting to me that it is possible still to experiment with curricula. It's possible to experiment with organizational structures. I think in Europe, the United States, it's much, much harder to do that because the investment in the way things are is so much greater. Africa, there is a kind of instability, which is also a kind of freedom. And if you're somebody who's really interested in, in trying to figure out where to go next, for me, there's no better space to do it in than, than, than Africa. Leslie, um, what do you think ties cities worldwide? What are the challenges that are basically also different from one place to another? So, for example, what are challenges that, are, that you find in Johannesburg, in Accra, and all these places that you lived in? It's, it's a really good question. I think um, one of the things that I've realized uh, now after maybe uh, 50 odd years is that the terms that we use are not universal. So when you talk about public in Europe, it's a different word, it's a different concept from talking about public in the United States, a different concept from talking about public in South Africa. So the particularity of each place is really meaningful. But the language that we use around cities, around architecture, I mean, I've taught now in three different continents. In some ways, the language I use is the same, but the meaning is not. And as an educator, this is a really, I think, an interesting space, is how do you translate these big concepts about cities, about urban life, about public, about civic, about the relationship between public and private? How do you talk about those things if they don't mean the same thing in the different contexts where you are? So you said today that we cannot expect to keep doing the same things and expect results. It's an invitation for change and for action. But how can our action actually prevent an unequal future? So one of the, I'm going to get into trouble for saying this, but one of the first things that I was told when I was working in the United States, I started my position just, just before the pandemic, and as the pandemic was unfolding, there was a lot of pressure on leadership to communicate. You know, like in a crisis, that's what leaders do, you communicate. And because it was very unscripted, like nobody knew what was happening. I remember when um, the mayor of New York issued, uh, I think they call it a shelter in place, an order. I didn't know what it meant. 
So you were acting very instinctively all the time because the situation was. Should I keep going? Because the situation was unfolding very, very fast. And I reacted instinctively and started to talk about what I saw. And what I saw was an incredible amount of inequity. I saw inequality almost everywhere I looked. And I would talk about this in, in my messaging. And I was told to be very, very careful about what I say in America, because this is a society of winners. Americans don't like to hear that they're losing. And I remember thinking, each society has its own paradigm. It has its own image of itself. And in a society where everyone thinks that they're winning, you can't easily talk about losing. But the truth is, in most com competitive societies, some people will win and some people will lose. So if we can't even talk about the word lose, all of the rhetoric around social justice, racial justice means nothing because actually we're not being honest about what's in front of us. So in, in some ways I would say that the first, the first step is, is honesty. We, we have to be really honest. Um, honest with ourselves and, and honest with each other. Leslie, in cities, how do we make common culture when we have different set of tools? Yeah. So as you said, uh, these cities are actually, like we have people coming from different places, each, uh, each one of them has, um, let's say, their own instrument, their own know-hows. Uh, how do you think cities can actually achieve to create a common culture where we embrace diversity, but at the same time, uh, we also put together and make these different tools work? So a, a few years ago, I had an interview with the mayor of Johannesburg, and we were chatting about the influx of people coming from the rural areas into the city. And you know, the urbanization rates in Africa are greater than they are anywhere else in the world. And we were kind of talking about how it is that people who come from the rural area, how do they know how to behave in the city? Like if you've never seen a city before, you've never been in city life, when you arrive, what do you do? How do you know how to, to be? And after some time, I said to him, so are you suggesting that we teach what it means to be a city dweller? Could this be a subject in a curriculum, for example? And he said to me, I'll only answer if you switch off the recorder. And he said, absolutely. We think that people know instinctively how to be in the city. Actually, we don't. So in the same way that you teach history, you could also teach civicness. You teach what are, what are the rules of engagement? What is the curriculum that we construct? that teaches us how to deal with conflict or how to deal with different value systems. I think we, we think that somehow people will just get it. We don't. Mm. So education, yeah. It's always about education. Always, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in your talk today, you also mentioned living and working together now more than ever. So let me ask you the question of the Biennale, since you are a juror for the Golden Lion this year. Um, how will we live together? I, I think with great with great difficulty, we will work this out. I mean, in some senses, we have no option but to work it out. Um, but I think it's a very profound question. It, 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 it talks about the how, what, what are the tools? Like, it's not just a rhetorical question. It's literally, I think you've said it before, how do we make common culture if our material interests conflict? But I think the question of who we is, is also really important, you know? And I don't just mean we in, in terms of cultural difference. We in terms of hierarchy, in terms of class, in terms of gender. Mm -hmm. So this question of who we are, I think, is a really profound question. And I remember about 20, maybe 25 years ago, in the UK, when it was the last major time, I think, that architectural education was being questioned. Like, you know, what are the things that you need to teach someone in order to become an architect? And back then, you know, you if you tried to say something about cultural identity, I think you'd have kind of, you'd have been laughed at in a way. It was, it was marginal, it was not central. I think the last 25 years have shown us that actually these things are completely central. Um, who we are is what drives us. Um, yeah. A lot of questions actually raised here today are aligned with the subjects that were tackled at the, Ve the Venice Biennale that uh, are actually um, being uh, tackled everywhere in the world, uh, also and in cities, in rural areas, etc. So you have like present action, social infrastructure, collective effort, local solutions to global challenges, even hybrid formats. So these uh, ideas have been circulating here and there in the architectural scene. 
can we talk maybe of a planetary challenge or like a problematic, let's say, of our times? Can we some, say something like uh, we are all in this together? But also, what would that achieve? I know that there is some sort of comfort in knowing that you are not alone facing sort of challenge, but where would that, where can this lead us to? I, I, I mean, it's, it's the brilliant conundrum. I mean, I'm right at the beginning of starting up an institute. And one of the big challenges is how do we design this institute? Like, what is the organizational structure? So if we want a different output, we cannot simply set up a school with the same hierarchy. The question of how you design new hierarchy, I think is also really, it's really challenging. But I will say this, that somehow my training as an architect has given me some of the tools required to think about new futures. And I think it's partly, there's, there's two things I think is really important here. Every architectural project is also a proposition. Like it, we, we can't just critique, you know, it, we have to propose something. So built into the way architects are trained is the idea of something that will come. The second thing is that architects usually think quite three-dimensionally around a problem. And it sounds like a cliche, but actually I know now when I'm thinking about how to do something. I'm thinking about how I look through the situation. I'm thinking about what it's like when I look from above. I'm thinking, I'm thinking really three-dimensionally about it. And that was my training. So in a peculiar way, I want to say that the, the, the education of an architect is actually a really fit education for a whole range of things that are actually nothing to do with buildings. Mm -hmm. It's about the design of society. And this has a dangerous aspect to it. You know, that's the demagogue that you know, can appear. But it also has a phenomenally productive and creative side to it. Um, so for me, it's a, it's a really unique, it's a unique set of tools. Since actually you mentioned this, I want to ask you, what do you think the role of architects are in visualizing the future? I think they're absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. And I think for a number of different reasons, and I've said this many, many times, Architecture is all about translation. You know, you translate an idea into a drawing, a drawing into a model, a model into a building, a building into a city. It's this constant displacement of meaning. You shift in scale, you translate. Process. It, and it's process, but it's also a process that's partly knowledge-driven, but also partly intuitive. One of the things I realized when I was teaching, in, 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 or when I have taught in Africa, is that there is almost no African alive who doesn't speak more than one language. Most Africans speak a minimum of two languages. So there's something about that constant translation where the training sits very, very well in the kind of DNA of the general population. And it was the first time I thought of architectural education as a way of being. It's not just something you receive and you train. It actually changes the way you think. So there is something, I think, in the tools that we're given that will enable us to imagine, literally to design a different kind of future. And if we think about architectural education only as training, which I think is, is the way it's often thought of, you know, training to become an architect, I think we miss the point. The new now is not new at all for a lot of places around the world, as you mentioned. Now that we have more awareness, what do you think is missing to actually achieve results, especially when it comes to social justice? So, uh, so products have taken up the streets and the public spaces around the world to advocate for urgent issues that have been, let's say, neglected or put on pause. But what more can people do? You know, it's not something that we, we usually talk about. Um, and I remember, and I'm going to speak very personally here, when I experienced death in my family for the first time, the people around me fell into two categories. The ones who said, what can I do? Tell me what to do. And the ones who said, you need a cup of coffee, here are some flowers. And for those who asked me what to do, I felt very strongly that they wanted me to take the responsibility at a time like that of telling them how to behave. The ones who came into a situation and said, look, you, you look really tired, here's a cup of coffee, took the responsibility of my grief, they took it. That's what I would call empathy. What I got from lots of other people was sympathy. And I think the difference between those two things is actually key. If we can train people to think empathetically, which is to say that you put yourself in someone else's shoes, you, you, you try to figure out what this means to them, the 
tools I think that we that emerge out of that situation are more they're better equipped what I think a lot of people want to do is to is to perform sympathy I mean I felt a little bit like this after Black Lives Matter like everybody was performing their sympathy actually this situation doesn't need sympathy this needs empathy this needs somebody to stop for a minute and say what is this like for you and that's only the beginning you can't stay in that state forever but as a starting point for me it's absolutely fundamental so today you spoke also of Im imagination and creativity how mm. do you how do you picture the future of big cities of metropolises i can't remember who said it but the city is the place where we meet people who are not like us i think that's for me that's the first thing about a city so in order to imagine a different kind of city i think we have to imagine what it is like to share compromise sometimes give up sometimes replace to be open to the fact that not all of us share the same value systems and that actually part of being in a city is creating those new value systems you know we talk about democracy and transparency and diversity you know these these This big titles. <laughs> huge titles but you know the real work of trying to figure out what those things mean that's that's tough mm. um, and it requires attention which increasingly we don't have um, and it, it 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 requires a kind of like i said before like an honesty if, if if the price of my privilege is that i have to give a little bit of it up what does that mean So let's talk a bit more about you. So you have founded the Africa uh, Future Institute. Can you tell us about your work in the institute? So um, this school has been at the back of my mind for, for a long time, almost 30 years. And the closest I came to it was in Johannesburg, where we started a new, a new school. It was in an existing university. Mm -hmm. And it grew very, very quickly. It had about 100 students by the time I left. Um, and it was an amazing, amazing experiment. And I was headhunted to move to the United States. And in some ways, I thought that what I was going to do there would be something similar, to bring the same ideas about curriculum change and so on to, to the US. And I found very quickly that actually the two contexts are very different. But after that experience in the States, I thought, I'm a little bit tired of trying to do this in someone else's country. Like I can talk about doing this elsewhere, but in some ways, you need to do this where, where you're from. So I've moved back. I mean, I've been going back and forth to Ghana for you know, 25 years, but to live and work there is very different from, from visiting. Um, and in some ways, this is like the last act for me. I mean, my late 50s now, I probably will not have another job. So in some ways, it's a good time because I, I'm going to give this thing everything. Um, and at the moment, we are building the infrastructure for the Institute, trying to work out like what does the organization look like? But there's a lot of appetite, I think, externally to see a school like this succeed. So I feel incredibly supported in, in some ways and in some aspects also incredibly alone with it which i think is a good thing is it going to be uh, very focused on accra no so it's the idea is it's a postgraduate school mm -hmm. so for, for students who have already an existing degree not only in architecture in in, in kind of visual disciplines um the ideal balance is to have about 50 percent of the students are Ghanaian, 25 african and 25 international um we want to keep it small um about 100 students 120 students is, is the maximum i think that we can control for now um but the idea is to put the infrastructure in place for something that will continue so part of the challenge is also not taking on too much right now because we have to be able to deliver and part of the challenge is is also building the confidence that, that we can do this i mean i was saying to someone the other day i'm so excited by the possibility of doing something where Africa leads, doesn't follow, it's, it's, it's forward facing, so yeah. It's amazing. You have taught architecture all over the world. How is it different from one place to another? Very different. Um, you know, in the UK, uh, you know, I went to the Bartlett, everyone jokes, you know, Bartlett students can't put a light bulb together. No. <laughs> um, in some extent that's true. But I was also very fortunate to be at a school that was very generous and the school was very confident in itself, which meant that it, it was very open to new ideas. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't fight at the Bartlett in the same way. When I went to South Africa, um, it was the first time I had been in a context where actually architecture as a discipline 
had done so much harm. You know, apartheid could not have happened if the profession at some level didn't comply. So there was a kind of shame in, in South Africa that was still quite close to the surface from, from the discipline's point of view. And you know, now in Ghana, it's really interesting that people's understanding of architecture is also very, very different. You know, architecture, I guess, is slightly closer to engineering than it is to the creative or the conceptual discipline that, that I studied. In the United States, again, really interesting, um, very much about conforming, very, very efficient, education system it you know pushes incredible numbers through the system but it's not the place for the iconoclast it's not the place for the maverick I mean, maybe the small pockets but, but, but I found that conformity actually quite difficult so you know, it goes back to that question that every time you use the word architect in a, in a different context it means something same. else yeah. yeah so at architecture school we are mostly taught about the past how do you perceive the future of architectural education? Much more interesting than the past. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the, the insistence on history, um, I, I think it's a really important concept to know that something came before, that, that things don't emerge out of nowhere. But I also recognize that sometimes in the post-colonial context, and South Africa for me was post-colonial, the United States is still very post-colonial, there's this kind of nervousness about projecting too far into the future because you're a little bit nervous about what the mother country, what the old country, where, where things are done properly, what do they think about you? And I remember used to say this in South Africa all the time, you know, the Europe that you look at is 50 years old. That Europe left the station a long time ago. It, it, Europe is no longer what you think it was. It has its own problems now. So Europe is not sitting here wondering what it is that you're doing. Just do it. So sometimes the past can, can be heavy. It, it's, it's also something that it, it saps your confidence. Yeah. So it's not to say that you, you can forget it. And I, I think also you know, people's nations' pasts are also complex, they're different. But you, you have to have the confidence to project some way into the future, otherwise that Einstein thing, you go on doing the same thing and you somehow think it's going to be different, it won't. Yeah. Leslie, thank you very much.